So, wonderful. Well, I warmly welcome you um, to our second session. As you heard, today is about microeconomics of price and wage uh, setting. Um, and um, we all in the recent decades witnessed quite structural, um, significant changes, uh, talking about e-commerce, um, uh, talking about uh, changes, advances in communication technology, um, talking about the lengthening um, in international supply changes. So um, with all this, um, we are asking ourselves, what is the impact um, of these changes um, uh, on price and wage setting? And alongside um, these developments, uh, so many countries experienced stagnating real wages and weak productivity. As a central banker, obviously, we follow such price and wage developments, and we become increasingly interested in how these developments can be understood at the micro level and how that might affect um, our tasks and functions in terms of monetary and supervisory policy. The papers and uh, discussions in these sessions will explore these and related themes with the help of outstanding scholars. First, we have Aviv Nevo, professor in business institutions and marketing at Northwestern University and former economist um, at the US Department of Justice. Aviv will talk about how current global and technological trends and advances in big data can shed light on price setting and inflation developments. His paper will then be discussed by Michael Weber, assistant professor of finance at the University of Chicago. Michael has worked in the fields of asset pricing and household uh, finance. And then we will have a short round of questions. And after that, our next speaker is Uta Schönberger, a professor of economics at University College London. Uta will consider how institutional settings affect different countries' performance in terms of productivity and wages. Uta's paper will be discussed by Michael Border, professor of economics at the School of Business and Economics, Humboldt Universität in Berlin. And um, Michael has worked in many fields, including labor and European integration. After that, we will have time for another round of questions, I hope for a very lively um, uh, debate. So we have a great set of presenters and discussants, and I would like Aviv to take the floor first. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for um, uh, having me here. Uh, although I do, I do have to say I'm still trying to figure out what exactly I'm doing here. Hopefully I will by the end of the talk. Um, this, is joint, uh, this is based on joint work with Arlene Wong uh, in terms of the vision of labor. Uh, <clears throat> everything you like about the talk, please credit Arlene. Everything you don't like about it, please blame me. Uh, I do hope that by the end of the talk there's gonna be much more in Arlene's column than in mine. Um, okay, so what am I gonna be talking about? I think we kind of, um, uh, touched about it. So there's been a lot of trends in, um, I call it advanced economies or in the global economy. Um, obviously globalization, a change in con competition and concentration, uh, a change in the structure of, um, of many industries, increased high fixed cost, a lot of innovation or marketing or whatever you want to call it upfront, and maybe lower marginal cost industries. Uh, and obviously a growth in e-commerce and more generally just the sharing economy. Uber, Airbnb, uh, and things of that um, sort. Um, and then finally, what I will claim, and this is maybe less, is that there's actually been a change in price setting behavior, the way that firms approach um, uh, pricing, both in terms of the data that's available to them, everyone likes to talk about big data, but firms really do have big data, enormous amounts that even 10 years ago, they did not have, and now not only they have it, they're actually trying to figure out how to use it, or starting to figure out. Um, all of these together means that there's going to be changes. And what I'm going to be talking about are really the micro um, changes from an I.O. slash marketing point of view. Uh, 
Uh, there's questions about what are the aggregate implications. I'll actually mostly stay away from it and leave that for the discussion, kind of thinking, you know, working with my comparative advantage, which is really on the micro side. So overview, I'm going to organize the discussion along two, um, two dimensions. One would be an issue of uh, measurement. Uh, I'll touch back on some good old themes of substitution bias, but say, you know, try to make the claim, maybe not too convincingly, but I'll try to make the claim that some of these issues are actually uh, getting magnified these days. And then I'll talk a little bit about some conceptual issues, uh, including cost pass-through, decreased competition, you know, quote-unquote new pricing models, uh, and heterogeneity. I'm probably not going to have enough time to get through all of them, but at least touch on some of them and set that up for the discussion. Now, to really be concrete and to touch about these, we need to have a more concrete questions. So I'll focus somewhat, although not really um, uh, in great detail, about the question of um, uh, low inflation during the recent recovery. And I'll have that as a kind of theme in the background, although I don't want this to be that a talk where I'm going to try to explain from a micro point of view why we had low inflation. Because if I set it up that way, you'll be very disappointed. I do not have an answer. Okay, I might have some points to think about, but I don't really have um, an answer. So speaking of answer or bottom line, um, this is not a talk that I think you'll walk away from saying, okay, what was the elevator pitch, the 30-second, what did we learn from this talk? Uh, I don't think I have a clear bottom line. To the extent that I want to emphasize or have sort of two main takeaways, I have the two points on the um, and two bullets here that in some sense are not all that original. How many times have you heard a talk when someone ends and says, we need more and better data or we need more research, right? I would say about 90% of talks. So this is going to be one of those 90%. But I am going to be a little bit different, hopefully, in the sense of saying we do really need more data, especially when it comes to online commerce. Right, because um, I think there was yesterday a discussion that was actually a very nice slide of looking for a, a needle in a haystack. Okay? Well, the claim that I will make is that not only are we looking for a needle in a haystack, we might actually be looking at the wrong haystack. Okay? We're focusing on the old economy. There's a whole new economy. We don't even have that haystack, let alone try to find a needle there. Okay? So that's going to be one, the first point. The other point is, in order to, to look at these questions, we really do need not just more research, but more collaborative research. Okay, not collaborative of one macroeconomist talking to another macroeconomist. Nothing wrong about that. It's great. You need to reach out. If you really want to understand what individuals are thinking about, whether they care about, um, you know, Yuri talked about yesterday about inflation expectations, um, whether they care about that, whether they care about other things, you probably want to talk to folks who study household consumer behavior. If you want to understand what firms are thinking about, you probably want to talk to people who, that's their business, talking to firms, working with firms, understanding how firms make decisions. And we really need a lot more of that. Now, that being said, I think there's been great progress made. I mean, there's um, the type of work that macroeconomists are doing these days. I mean, you wouldn't have people like, you know, Michael or Arlene, my co-author, doing this work maybe 10 or 15 years ago. So there's been great strides along that, but I think there's still a ways to go and still bringing a lot more of the true micro foundations uh, into uh, um, uh, macro research. Okay, so I said I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, why inflation is low. So um, I'll take it as a fact that inflation is, um, at least measured inflation, let me be clear about that, uh, has stayed persistently low pro, uh, post the Great Recession. Part of what we've been asked to give is to say, well, from an IO marketing point of view, why is this? Okay, I'm not going to have a clear answer, uh, but I'll give you at least some ideas, some of the ways that uh, an I.O. economist might start thinking about this. So why do we expect inflation to rise post-recession? This was really more a slide for me, trying to understand, okay, what's the question before I try to answer it? So I went to Arlene and asked, you know, why do you macro guys expect um, uh, inflation to rise? So I've been given at least one reason, is a tightening job market uh, would lead to higher wages, and those should be passed through to prices. That's not necessarily the only mechanism, but I think that's, I see a lot of heads nodding, so at least I didn't get that one wrong. Um, that's, I think, kind of the simpler mechanism. So I guess to ask, would this lead to higher prices, you first have to ask, did wages go up? Right? I mean, because if that's the beginning of the mechanism. Um, it seems like maybe not, but I'm actually not going to touch much about that. I'm going to leave that to the labor economist uh, to say much about that. I think the only thing I can say is an I.O. competition point of view is to say, we're going to talk a little bit later about monopoly power, but you can also wonder whether monopsony power, right, as we see more concentration, does that actually lead to more monopsony power in the labor market, and could that be part of the reason why we're not seeing wages increase? 
Okay, so that's kind of the competition aspect. Uh, I'm not going to say much about it beyond having a reference to some work by some of my colleagues um, uh, at Penn. Okay, there's additional reason, additional mechanism it could go on. Uh, I'm not going to be really focusing on that. So what I'm going to sort of be looking at is saying, let's assume for a second that you know wages did go up or went up to some extent. Question is, will these be passed on to prices? What will we expect in terms of um, prices? So for an I.O. economist, it's not obvious that even if wages went up, that we would necessarily see an increase in prices. Okay? I mean, we'll see some, but we're not, it doesn't necessarily have to be significant. And there are several reasons, and I'll talk about some of them. One is just a pure measurement. So it could be that actual prices are going up, but the measured inflation is not. So that's going to be the first part of, um, um, of the talk. Then I'll talk about the issues of imperfect pass-through and how at least microeconomists, I.O. economists think about it. And then I'll try to kind of weave in longer-term um, uh, secular trends that might be bringing to some sort of structural, um, uh, structural change. Okay, and again, I'm just going to provide uh, you know, some exploration of this, and hopefully the discussion later in the panel uh, after the break will touch into this. So measurement of inflation. Um, good old substitution bias, we all know it, we've talked about it. I'll talk a little bit more about it, although what I'm going to be talking about is not exactly, you know, the traditional substitution bias, it might actually be something a little bit different. Um, new products, online shopping, I would actually say that is a change that we're constantly seeing. There's more and more introduction of new products. They're easier to do. Used to be that, you know, you wanted a new product, you had to come up with a distribution chain and whatever. Now all you have to do is to get Amazon to sell it for you, and you can sell that new product. Okay. Online shopping, obviously, is increasing um, uh, as well. And, you know, the issue of measuring prices online is going to be a big issue. So let me touch on each of these very shortly. So substitution bias, we all know. Really when prices change, how do consumers react? What do they, uh, what do, they do? Uh, typically, people talk about either products, outlets, new products as biases that give. Um, I actually think that the same ideas should be looked at much more broadly. And part of the work that Arlene and I have done in the past is actually looked at the substitution bias in, you know, across products, that is the traditional way, but also across sizes. So you might say, you know, okay, we're the macroeconomists. Do we care what size of a laundry detergent people buy? Well, you do if you care about what the decisions that people are facing at the store. So when people are looking at prices at the store, they're not thinking about the inflation expectation. Okay? What they're thinking about is, should I buy the larger size versus the smaller size? Should I use a coupon? Should I buy the product because it's on sale? Because if I buy it on sale, it's 20% less. Okay? This kind of temporary price reduction. They're not thinking about, is the inflation going to be 2 or 2.5%? Two okay? Now, what implications this have for the macro economy? I have no idea. But I'm telling you, that's what consumers think about when they make um, choices. So we're going to look at some of these effects, and I'll actually show you that there's an interaction between these effects and macroeconomic conditions. Okay, so there's several papers preceding ours. There's a long list here that I don't have uh, uh, time to cover that has talked about how shopping behavior changes with economic conditions. Okay, and this is across different countries, the U.S., the U.K. Um, uh, there's a paper here looking at Argentina and others. Okay, people have looked at it. We've looked at it specifically in the context of... Um, the Great Recession, so we extend some of this work here. So what we looked at is how shopping patterns change um, uh, with macroeconomic conditions. So what I have here, these are the fraction of purchases that are on sale. Okay, so a sale is a temporary price reduction. Then just think of it, the price goes down for a week. What fraction of the purchases um, are made there? So what you see here is you see the shaded area, that's the, um, uh, the time of the recession, and you see that sales were actually on a downward trend uh, slightly before that. That stopped during the recession, and actually there was mid-recession a big jump. That's something we documented in our previous work. Um, and what we see is post-recession, there's kind of a return to the pre-recession trend. We haven't actually got there in terms of levels, okay? but there is um, a decrease. Now, you might sort of say, look, in terms of numbers, isn't that big? We went from 25 percent of purchases to about, you know, 26 and a half, 27. But in terms of fraction, I mean, that's an increase of, you know, quite significant, almost a 10 percent increase in the fraction of purchases that are um, on sale. Looking at coupons, same type of um, uh, behavior. You see a increase, a jump during the recession, and then what seems to be a decrease. Uh, by the way, in all of these, I didn't say the very jagged line, that's just literally the data. 
the green line, that's a flitted uh, uh, linear spline and then a cubic spline, just to kind of try to get, tease out some of the trends. So that's two types of shopping behavior. How about products? This is looking at generic products. Again, here you see kind of maybe less pronounced of a trend during the recession, or a little bit of an increase during the recession, and a clear decrease afterwards. Yeah. Um, and this is generic products. That's talking a little bit more product substitution. See, less of an effect than you did um, uh, in the other two products. How about stores? So this is looking at discount stores. Here there's just a general increase that's it's kind of hard to tease from the data. Basically, this is US data. So this is the increase of Walmart. And Walmart was growing before the recession. If you squint very hard, it seems like it slowed down a little bit during the recession. Okay, but you have to squint really hard to look at it. And then it seemed to have picked back up uh, post-recession. But it's actually all swamped by just the general increase that Walmart is growing. Uh, and there's more, um, more of it. Okay? So it seems to be that there's a change in the, um, um, in the behavior. And this is not necessarily your traditional substitution bias. It's more of a change in consumer behavior due to the economic conditions. It could be because people have more time to shop or uh, take on their activities. So, could this have an impact on inflation? We didn't actually compute it um, uh, a formal analysis, but just the back of the envelope calculation suggests that taking this into account could actually mean that the measured inflation post-recession is about 20% um, or the actual inflation is 20% higher than measured inflation. So measured inflation is too low. So it directionally does go in the effect if we think inflation, measured inflation is lower than what we'd expect, this directionally could go in that direction. I'm not actually saying this is a number that I would stand by. This is just really a back of the envelope calculation. It's actually pretty hard to compute an exact index. I think uh, uh, Jim alluded to uh, yesterday on how sometimes computing an exact index that accounts for all these effects, it's quite hard. It's the case here as well. Okay, so this is just kind of to give you an idea that there might be something here. Okay. Um, so overall, you know, did shopping behavior uh, revert after the recession? Yes. Could that explain directionally low inflation? Maybe. Uh, is this large enough to explain what we're seeing? Again, I'll leave it up to you, but probably not. Okay, so this can't be all of the story. And then a more general question here, which I'll just pose and not really try to address, is to say, okay, so you saw these kind of behaviors and you can ask whether they're big or not during the recession or after the recession, um, but is there kind of a change, a secular change over time? I would say maybe there is, okay? Because you could say, okay, whatever happened in this recession, why didn't we see it in previous recessions, okay? I mean, what's changing? I would say maybe there is a change in shopping behavior. So I don't have time to cover that fully, but let me give you a little bit of an idea. So here's a, um, uh, a paper by a couple of um, uh, young folks at, um, at Chicago. They looked at, you know, prov product variety. So they're actually showing an increase in uh, concentration in the uh, products that households are consuming. So what they measure here is over time, um, a Herfindahl index of the concentration, a household level concentration. And they're actually saying consumers are concentrating more of their purchases in fewer brands or fewer products. So that's a change over time in shopping behavior. Might not actually go in the way that we'd expect, but it's just showing there is a change. And that's really all that I'm trying to say here. The other big change, of course, is online shopping. We didn't really touch on it there, but that's kind of if you want the elephant in the room. Um, that, you know, big change. Here is actually showing overall commerce uh, in the U.S. over the last 15 years. Basically, e-commerce as a fraction of total re retail sale. So it's only at 10% now, but you look at how fast it's growing. If you look at what's happening to Amazon stock, you realize this trend is here and it's here to stay. Okay, so what does this actually have to, um, um, have to do with inflation? Well, <laughs> Jerry Hausman wrote a very interesting paper a little bit more than uh, 10 years ago that was talking about uh, CPI bias from super centers. And I highlight a particular part of it. He asked, does the BLS know that Walmart exists? Okay, so this was in 2004. You could ask, that, write that same title, and instead of Walmart, substitute Amazon, eBay, Uber, Airbnb, and the list goes on and on. Okay, so there is a question as to whether the BLS or generally statistical agencies even measure online prices. Okay, that's a little bit unclear what they do. You say, well, you could give the excuse, well, yeah, they don't, but it's just a sampling issue. As long as it's a random sample and they're not behaving any differently, then you know, why do we care? But there's a lot of good theory to sort of suggest that it would act differently. You have a lot more tools to price discriminate and to segment consumers in very different ways online than you would um, 
uh, in retail and um, offline, and that might suggest that you will see separate prices. And indeed, a recent paper that just came out uh, a few weeks ago by Goolsby and Kleenow suggests that when you look at online prices, you do see different inflation. They actually find lower inflation, which again, maybe isn't consistent with this story of what's happened post recession They're just saying, look, there's something else going on there. There's a different haystack. We've got to start looking at it. Okay, that's kind of simple as that if you want. Okay, so that's kind of in terms of measurement. I kind of went through it quickly, but I'm already kind of uh, way behind. So let me just kind of quickly go through some of the more conceptual issues. Um, cost pass-through. So it seems intuitive if wages go up or any cost goes up, so should prices. But looking from a microeconomic uh, perspective, it doesn't have to be. So if we just write the simplest um, uh, pricing model that we can, saying, okay, there's a firm trying to maximize profit, where pri profits are price minus marginal cost, variable profits times quantity minus the fixed cost, will give us the following first order condition. Basically says price is equal to marginal cost plus a markup term. Now, it's very easy to sort of look at this and say, hey, marginal cost is on the right-hand side, so if it goes up, price should go up one by one. Right? Well, that's not right because that term, that semi-elasticity, that's the markup term, depends on price. So if you want to compute what the optimal price is, that will vary. And generally, um, it depends really on the shape of the demand curve. And here, this is a residual demand curve. So competition and the effect of it will be in there as well. So depending on the shape of the demand curve, um, the pass-through should not, you know, generally would not be complete. It could actually be less than one, sometimes even more than one. Typical demand curves that we work with will give us pass through less than one. A linear demand curve, for example, gives us a pass through of 0.5. Measured pass through, when people have looked at it, are significantly less than one. Okay, I mean, when you look at micro studies, the only, there's only one industry where I've seen consistently pass through the rates that are greater than one. Okay, and I'll have a, uh, a poll later if you guys can guess which it is. All right, I'll tell you, it's tobacco, cigarettes. So whenever there's taxes on it, they're usually passed through within more than 100%. There's actually good economic reasons why that might be the case, having to do with who are the people that stay with you uh, once prices increase. Okay, so I think to sort of realize, even if wages go up, it's not clear that price should go up. Taking empirical measures should be that this password could actually be quite low, depending on the circumstances, um, could be you know pretty close to, um, uh, to zero. And I kind of mentioned this to my colleagues at Penn, one of my macro colleagues, said, oh, I don't really, I mean, so it's an interesting theory, but I don't buy it. There's no way firms are eat, eating the cost. I said, this is not eating the cost. This is a profit maximizing response. As your costs increase, what is your optimal price response, right? It's this trade-off between margin and quantity, and sometimes you're better off saying, look, I want to sell more volume, less margin. This is not eating the cost, okay? This is the optimal response. Um, so the question is here, going to low inflation, could be if indeed, okay, our labor colleagues are going to tell us wages haven't really gone up for whatever reasons, the labor market, they've gone up, but maybe not as much. Maybe the shift to price is also low because of these um, um, lower cost pass through. So now the question is, what's happened? Why is this sort of change? Okay, this kind of pass, pass through mechanism could have been there previous recessions. What has changed? Okay, so this is where I get kind of uh, briefly to the long-term trends. So one long-term trend that's kind of been very popular in, um, uh, especially in I.O. Um, circles, is to talk about the fact that there's really a, a rise in market power, a rise in margins, a rise in concentration. Um, uh, Jan, one of the co-authors that's actually um, of a paper that's quite highly cited um, and is sitting right there. And there's a question that this could be impacting pass-through. And it could in two ways. One is the fact that most of this document, what it really is documenting is a decrease in the share of, um, the, of labor. Okay, so the share of labor is decreasing, and really what, you know, this paper in particular, what it does is it translates that into a markup uh, using kind of various uh, assumptions about the production function side. Okay? Now, as you have, even holding pass-through constant, as you have a low, labor being a lower share, you just can think of, I don't know, price of labor goes up by 10%, it just proportionally is going to impact prices much less as it's a smaller share. Okay, so this is just almost kind of, you know, just pure arithmetic. The other thing is, if it really is a decrease in competition, competition has an impact on that pass-through. Okay, because that pass-through is a residual demand curve. Now, we know that in the case of perfect competition, okay, the textbook case of perfect competition, pass-through is one. 
because prices are equal to marginal cost. Marginal cost increase, there'll be a pass through of one. Generally, though, as you have um, um, less and less competition, you know, there isn't a monotonic relation. It'll go either way. All that we know is we can no longer guarantee that it's one, but it's one of those things, no one will tell you there's a theorem that tells a particular way, but there is a belief among many I.O. economists that as competition decreases, you're going to get lower pass-through rates. Okay, some kind of believe in it more than others. Some actually even use it as a test of imperfect competition, uh, but there is that belief. So going along with that belief, if you actually believe that the economy is becoming less and less competitive, the pass-through rates might actually become lower. Okay? Um, more complex supply chain. Uh, so there actually has been, uh, there's again a recent paper that's talked about the fact that um, uh, there's globalization, leads to a much more complex um, supply chain, right? So instead of actually getting your supplies from someone down the road, it could be much, um, uh, a much longer supply chain. What does this have? Um, two implications. One is there's um, no longer kind of a link or a weaker link between local market conditions and the output market. That's one. And more importantly for the point that I'm trying to make is the fact that there's more levels mean that there's more of these pass-through, right? So if you just think of one level of there's just a seller, they have an increase in their cost, they have to pass it through. But if you have these multiple levels, then there's this imperfect pass-through at multiple levels, right? So you take 0.5 in each of them, and now it's 0.5 you know, the power of 10, because there might be 10 different levels, you're going to get a very small number, okay? So that could be kind of um, uh, one implication. Uh, this paper that I mentioned, one of the things that they point out, I think it's an interesting fact, is a, what seems to be a divergence um, between the PPI and the CPI. And if we had more time, we can actually talk about it, but let me kind of uh, move ahead. And then finally, um, the last point that I'm going to talk about is really in the change in how firms um, set prices. Um, in part, this has, you know, two components. They have more data, they can do things more efficiently. I actually think, especially with the growth of business schools over the last 20 or 30 years, you see more and more companies that are actually pricing according to that simple pricing model that I had, as opposed to a simple pr a cost, plus, a cost plus model. And that has kind of a long-term trend that could actually have implications to how we're going to get passed through um, uh, in the economy. The other thing is, up to now I've talked about just the linear pricing, but we can think more and more price discrimination, and you can see a discussion. This is where the big data comes in, okay? So this is one quote Uber talks about how they can actually set route-specific prices, and they do. If you actually want ever an experiment, sit in a, in a restaurant with your friends, pull out your phones, try to order an Uber, and you'll get, you know, five different quotes going to the exact same place. Um, uh, again, there's a lot of discussion that historically we couldn't have perfect individualized prices, perfect, you know, one um, uh, first degree price discrimination. Now uh, we can do that. So what does that, um, uh, what does that mean? Well, two things. First is I think there is a change in how firms are pricing. They have better data. They have different models. Quant now is the, that's the buzzword in all business schools. Okay, now do they know how to apply our models? No, not quite yet, but they're getting there. Okay, and they're changing their prices. And that's part of what we're seeing these prices, these changes, for example, let's say in the markups that we're seeing. Part of it is not necessarily a change in concentration. It's a change in firms realizing we've been leaving money on the table. And if I had more time, I could actually give you many examples uh, of this. What this does is it means that there's going to be fancier pricing models. Okay, and fancier is that, you know, stuff that we as economists have been talking about for 30, Change 40, and even more years. Markups, okay, but seeing, they're now actually getting implemented really a change in the field, concentration, and it brings the whole in issue of measurement to a whole new level. We've been leaving okay, money on the now, table. Because now, if it's not and just linear prices, time, if give you many examples. bundled, and all kinds of stuff like that, it gets, it's a whole different levels that even theoretically, I'm not sure we know how to do, and we definitely don't have the, uh, uh, the data. And then on top of that, there's going to be a lot of heterogeneity, the fact that different people might actually be seeing different inflation levels, and we have um, some measurement of that. And again, that brings it to a whole new level. So with that in mind, let me conclude. Um, what I talked about are a couple of you know, measurement issues, conceptual issues. Um, I hope I kind of made you know, two points that it came across. A, we need more data, both in terms of online, individualized data to really get at the heart of these um, questions. And I think to really get at them, we need to work together, we being marketing guys together with macroeconomists and um, uh, central bankers. So let me stop here. I'm actually 40 seconds behind, but ahead of my expectations. So. Perfect timing. <laughs>
I'd be right. Okay, perfect. So thanks a lot for the organizers to uh, allow me to think about those topics. So what I want to do is actually also try to uh, provide maybe five themes in 15 minutes and see whether I'll be successful in sticking to that. So first, I want to look at a little bit of an historical perspective and possibly argue that we might be able to actually learn from past periods of low inflation, whether we have maybe some insights what might have cost them. Then secondly, I want to follow up on two themes of we was alluding to. And lastly, actually, on, on two of the topics Yui was actually talking about yesterday. So how possibly one could manage expectation. I don't want to talk about manipulation. It sounds so bad. And maybe actually try to figure a little bit out how actually people form inflation expectations. So here we all know this figure. This is just over time annualized CPI inflation in the US. And so Larry Summers talked two days ago about the great uh, inflation, so if you would start there and then would compare the last 10 years to the historical mean, you would indeed conclude possibly by looking at the last 10 years, definitely below the red line, so clearly we have historically low inflation. But who says actually that we should actually start in 1970, we could go back 10 years, the mean already, the red line goes down a little bit, but who says we should maybe start in the 60s, maybe we might be concerned that there's measurement error, data quality might be worse and so on, so we could actually maybe start in 1990. And you already see that actually the, the red line goes down and down. So I guess bottom line here would be to say that depending on what we would argue is actually the normal, we would actually possibly draw different conclusions. But I think what I want to take away from, from those figures is actually go, go back maybe to here and say, well, possibly in macro it's over 30 over time series, 10 years request one on the other and say, well, now we have actually low inflation. But possibly we might be able to learn something from taking a more historical perspective and maybe just look at possibly getting data in the past when we also had low inflation to possibly even distinguish between competing mechanisms. Is it lower path through more concentrations and things like that? And just for completeness, let me also directly look at the Eurozone. And here possibly we could also say we have historically low inflation. So bottom line one, possibly let's learn from the past. Then let's follow up on two of the themes Aviv was actually talking about. So on the one hand, you could now say, well, what are the secular changes we've seen in the last three, four decades? I want to highlight one specific mechanism, automation, increased uh, compute use of computers, and how this might affect it possibly some patterns we see in the data. On the other hand, follow up a little bit on increases in market con uh, power, a look at one specific data set of easy access to, and then, as I said, a little bit thinking about how people form expectations and whether they actually are indeed, as we would model them typically in our preferred New Keynesian model. Okay, so if you now actually look at overall inflation, what this actually tells you is maybe not that much, because if you drill down at the industry, there's lots of heterogeneity. We see there are lots of pattern differential movements, and actually looking at overall inflation, camouflage is maybe the most interesting piece of evidence, what we can learn. But at the same time, actually, if you think about starting in the 1980s, people started to use more computers, firms started to use more computers. There's been this increased automation, use of robotics. We have also increased on in, uh, let's say, import competition. And then actually there's this recent interesting paper by Otto and Dawn, and what they actually argue is, if you look at this figure, what you see on the x-axis, this is just a proxy for skill to the far left, low skill, far right, high skill. And here on the y-axis, you see the change in the average age of per people by skill over time from 1980 till today. And what you actually see is that low-skilled workers and high-skilled workers on average saw this way lower increase in the average age in this occupation relative to middle-class jobs. And so they argue that this, this uh, job is getting old. So middle-class jobs on average saw a larger increase in the median age of people working there. And so the question now is, could it possibly be the case that larger workforce, lower bargaining power in terms of wages, lower wage growth, could that possibly lead to an observed lower inflation exactly in those industries where you saw increase in computerization, robotics, and so on. And so I was actually went to the data and actually tried to see whether there is a little bit of, of evidence for that mechanism. So you now can use data from the census. Every five years, you get uh, average hours worked by age for each industry, and you can create what I call old to young ratio or old to all. This is just the total hours worked by people above 55, and no inference on people in the room, of course, relative to all the hours worked in this occupation. And then you can actually relate that to the average annual inflation rate at the industry level and just actually see whether 
maybe the SSN association at the beginning of the five year period, you saw a higher share of old workers relative to young workers. Do actually those industries experience lower inflation subsequently? And then also drilling a little bit down on the mechanism, is it due to lower wage growth exactly in those industries? And of course, you might be concerned about international factors, so you can be proxying for shipping costs, which actually possibly tell us something about import competition. Of course, if you have actually a lower unemployment, you would also expect maybe lower wage growth. But crucially, actually also, you would expect that this mechanism, if it's at play, is actually more important in industries with higher uh, uh, labor intensity, so you can also proxy for that. And so what you see here in the first row in red is actually in the raw data, column one, controlling for common shocks in the time dimension, for industry-specific shocks, meaning having different uh, degrees of fixed effects, but also actually sucking up different parts of the variation in the last columns, you see actually that indeed in industries where you have a higher share of old workers at the beginning of the five-year period, you see lower average inflation, and also actually I think it can explain a meaningful part of the variation. And crucially, I think in terms of the mechanism in blue, you see that this effect is actually larger the more the higher labor intensity you see in that industry. Maybe actually looking at those numbers, it's not too elusive. So let's actually look a little bit also at some figures. So what you see here on the x-axis, you see actually bint uh, ratios of old to young, far left, low old to young ratios, far right, high young to ratio, uh, young, uh, old to young ratio. On the y-axis, you have industry inflation, and then five peer, yeah, by five-year period, you see that actually there's across the board this negative association, maybe a little bit less than in the intermeeting years in the 90s, but actually you see this very tight clustering about the regression around the regression line, especially in the last 10, 15 years, or so possibly indeed an aging industry workforce and lower com uh, what the wage bargaining power might play a role. And in terms of actually exactly the mechanism, you indeed see that in those very industries where you see a higher ratio of all to young workers, you also see subsequently lower wage growth. And again, you can explain a meaningful part of the variation. Okay, so now let's follow up a little bit, okay, bottom line two bars, so the first one we can learn from history, the second one is, okay, there's potentially some change in the age composition of the workforce, which might help explain some patterns we see in the data. I want to follow up on the part Arifa's raising, maybe this increase in competition, this might, how this might affect price setting. Of course like uh, Jan Eckhut and co-authors are using is great. You have actually all publicly listed firms. The downside is that you don't really observe the pricing patterns unless you go to the basement of the BLS, what you and I have done in the past. And I can promise you that's not too much fun. So instead, what I'm trying to do here is actually use data from retail scanners, also a little bit leveraging the idea of using big data. So here you see trillions of observations for individual goods over time. And you can actually say, do we see at the local level increases in competition? And so the way I did that, I said, well, let's now define a market based on goods which are on the one hand substitutable, but also in areas which are very similar in terms of local economic shock. So I, for example, one area you can think of is like the East Bay, San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose. And in terms of actually type of granularity, so you don't want to look at Duplo and Danuta individually because depending on price, you might have substitute between Duplo and Danuta. So overall, we want to actually define maybe chocolate candy bars as one product category. And then actually the interaction of the two is defining my market. And then what I can do is just actually look trillions of price observations and argue and see whether there is any pattern in concentration over time. So I concentrate, uh, uh, calculate a standard Herfindahl, Hirschman index, but also a leaf out version. And then actually, and this was a little bit surprising, if you actually look just at concentration over time, so a very specific uh, market, so only groceries, and actually um, what you see here only the last uh, 10 years, this is due to data availability. You see actually, if anything, in groceries, this is actually holds across definitions, you actually see a decrease in concentration over time in, in, that, uh, in that data. But again, so we have to keep in mind, this is only a very specific, specific uh, cut of the data. And then you can ask, well, is there actually an association between log prices and concentration? You can also run it in differences. And here what you see, there's this negative association. So if you see higher concentration, this tends to be associated with lower prices at the local level and at the local uh, category level. And so I think this, I want to actually reiterate what Avif was saying. We ultimately definitely have to understand way better the I.O., the industrial organizations, how to actually now 
let's say, chains like Aldi or Walmart price at the local level. And I think this is definitely also something I would encourage more research on. And now the last two, uh, two uh, bullet points, or the last two points I want to come back is a little bit what, what Yuri Gornichenko and Oli Korpiov were alluding to yesterday. So at the end of the day, to the extent you believe in, I think, the standard model at central banks, the New Keynesian model, policies are effective because intertemporal substitution is at play. And so whatever shifts or moves the real interest rate should lead to changes in consumption patterns. And so one way to possibly move real interest rates would be due to changes in inflation expectations. And so I guess we should better understand whether indeed, on the one hand, how people form inflation expectations, whether people act on inflation expectations, but crucially also then possibly why in the data some policies are less effective than others. And I was just want to allude to this forward guidance puzzle. So the first thing I want to now look at is actually how people even form inflation expectations. And this is, as I promised uh, yesterday, Jim, this goes back to a speech you gave in 2011 when you argued that we as central bankers typically focus on core inflation, but instead actually maybe we make systematic policy mistakes because if you look at the data, it looks like the most salient experience of prices is actually from shopping trips. You pass by the pump, of course those are very high frequency movements, but now actually if it's the case that individuals form expectations looking at those very transient price movements, and if they act on those expectations, maybe keeping them out from our measure of inflation might lead to systematic mistakes. And so, of course, the question now is, can we actually learn anything from the data whether people indeed form expectations by looking at prices in supermarkets. And again, this goes back to Arvis' point. We can actually use big data. So again, use the AC Nielsen data, trillions of observations at the individual level. And then use actually tailored surveys where you ask people in this AC Nielsen data set, 90,000 households, you just ask them, what do you think is inflation? What do you think actually will inflation be over the next 12 months? And crucially also lots of things, how they actually form inflation expectations. And when I started actually working on that topic, one of my colleagues, Anil Kashyap, who is now external committee member in, in the UK, he told me actually, Michael, you shouldn't really work on those inflation expectations of individuals because they are all over the place. And particularly until you can explain to me the most salient pattern in the data, you shouldn't do that. And what did he mean by that? He said, well, in the data across countries, sample periods and cuts, it's always the case that women have higher inflation expectations than men, which doesn't make any sense to me. So we ran our own survey and we see the very same pattern in column one. You see that male in the data on average have inflation expectation that is 1.3 percentage points lower than women. And again, this doesn't really make too much sense. Why should there be a gender effect in inflation expectations? But then actually you can actually ask tons of other questions. And one of the questions we ask, who is the main grocery shopper in your household? And what you see in column two, Within household, if my wife does the grocery, she actually has high inflation expectations. Instead, if it's me, you see I actually have high inflation expectations. So this gender uh, effect in column two completely is subsumed uh, sub uh, by this grocery dummy, which equals one if within household, he or she is making the groceries. Now, of course, you can also do the same exercise. Just look at men and women separately. Within men, within women, is there a grocery effect? And if anything, actually, if you look at column four relative to column three, it looks actually that the grocery effect is even stronger among men than among women. You, in the aggregate, you don't see it because, on average, more women make the groceries relative to men. But if anything, actually, also men seem to extrapolate from observing prices in the supermarket on their decisions and uh, on their expectations. In the paper, we actually also provide evidence that they would actually behave in line what you would expect from an Euler equation. So potentially, we might want to keep in mind things like that. And so the fifth point I want to briefly allude to a little bit is actually maybe providing some empirical evidence to what Mike Woodford recently said. So I think it's fair to say that he has been the intellectual mind behind what we've seen the central banks doing in the last decade. So he, 2003, already argued that, well, why should we care about the CLB? We don't really have to worry about it if we are able to manage inflation expectations and actually raise inflation expectations from the CLB binds, we don't have to worry at all about this lower uh, bound constraint. More recently, however, it looks like he updated his own beliefs a little bit because in his recent NBR macro annual paper, the second sentence of his abstract reads, we assume unrealistic cognitive abilities on part of our decision maker in the model. So if you promise to keep interest rates at zero until the end of the liquidity trap, this generates inflation and we are fully
plan that today we should update our inflation expectations upwards, and that's why we should consume way more. You could possibly argue that limited cognitive abilities might hinder the effectiveness of that policy, and we know empirically there is what's called the forward guidance puzzle in the data that seems less effective than we might have thought based on our representative age and new Keynesian model. So of course, if you now want to see whether limited cognitive abilities play a role, you somehow have to observe measures of limited cognitive abilities, ideally for a large cross-section of people. And so we have this recent work, which only thanks to data by the Finnish Central Bank was possible. So we got for all men in Finland, due to mandatory military entrance tests, IQ data from 81 until 2002. And then you can link it actually based on social security numbers, to the household balance sheet, inflation expectations. And what I wanted to show you here is just look at the x-axis. One means low IQ. Lowest 4% of the population, nine means high IQ, highest 4% of the population, and it's approximating a normal distribution. If you look what people say in service, what do you think is inflation over the next year? You subtract what is exposed realized, you take the absolute value, and you average by bin. You see actually that low IQ men, at least in Finland, have forecast errors for inflation, which is, are two and a half times as large relative to the forecast error for for a high IQ man. Now you might wonder, does it matter? So you can run Euler equations. Do people, typically in our Euler equation, if we expect higher inflation, we would also actually start consuming more. Do that, run it for within men of high IQ, within men of low IQ, you see that only men which have high cognitive abilities indeed would react in line with the Euler equation. I can actually show you in the paper, this is not driven by low IQ men being off the Euler equation, so meaning by financial constraints or things like that. And I think lastly, oftentimes, you know, as central bankers, we try to actually maybe lower interest rates, conventional policy to stimulate investment and demand through maybe a credit channel. What I'm plotting here on the right y-axis, you see over time just a short-term normal interest rate. Now, let's actually see whether there's any interesting heterogeneity in the propensity to take out loans by low and high IQ. And the way I actually mean low and high IQ, just split your sample in the middle, low IQ, uh, top 50%, high IQ, uh, bottom 50%, and uh, top 50%. So if you focus on high IQ, man, at least, again, this is specific for Finland, I don't want to extrapolate. When interest rates go down, their propensity to take out loans go up, interest rates are flat, propensity are flat, Interest rates go up, propensity goes down. So this is not just graphical evidence. You can also do it actually in a regression framework that's highly statistically significant. Now instead, actually look at low IQ men. There's no change in the propensity to take out loans over time as a function of interest rates. Now you might argue, okay, maybe we don't, uh, don't want to stimulate consumption of low IQ men, but to the extent that we use common policy and some people react and others don't react, we might be concerned at least through about implicit redistribution mechanisms. So what I wanted to do in this talk is actually, on the one hand, argue that possibly we can use historical data to learn more about why we might see low inflation. We actually have some evidence that possibly changes in the age of the labor force might be relevant for trends in inflation. In terms of grocery data, at least, we don't see increases in uh, concentration. And lastly, I think, we should actually better understand how people form inflation expectations. My understanding is that the ECB is also trying to actually purchase a shopping data, and so I think this would be very useful. And also, I think we might think about what we label human frictions, that maybe parts of the population don't react to policies. And so bottom line is we need to think about policy salience, policy communication, how they actually together shape the effectiveness of policy. Thank you. Well, many thanks, Michel. Many, many thanks, Aviv. That was quite interesting. I have all kinds of questions, and I would love to have the data for women and IQ, yeah, um, and how they fare with loans, yeah. I can but it's much higher. It's much higher. It's much higher. <laughs> okay. okay, good my to know. My wife has told me repeatedly it's much higher for women. Okay. And my second comment would be to being in charge of statistics in the ECB. I see a lot of work coming to us, yeah, with regard to the big data, yeah, and I, I. I never experienced something else than eco economists being very greedy with regard to data. <laughs> yeah. So um, the floor is open uh, for questions. And um, I would um, ask you to, um, to tell me whom you would like to ask the question, yeah? so that we know um, who is addressed. Please. Uh, 
I'm Liviu Voina from Romania. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Nevo because he mentioned about um, about post-crisis uh, uh, wages, rising wages post-crisis should lead to higher inflation, but empirically we don't see it. And I would uh, like to challenge you to think in terms of uh, stock instead of flow. Um, wage gaps instead of simple, of simple wage dynamics. So if you consider that a recession is a game changer and it's a, um, there is uncertainty of future income, then the reference for a worker is not ahead of him because he doesn't know uh, about his future employment or wage. The reference is behind him. So the past peak income, uh, maximum uh, peak income in the past. Uh, therefore, until he recovers what he lost uh, after a recession, he's not willing to spend more. Basically, this would be a cumulated wage gap. Uh, I wouldn't uh, uh, make reference to, uh, to this if you didn't mention uh, that fact, but, but indeed, post-crisis Phillips curve, I think, is completely different uh, than, uh, let's say, in a normal, uh, in a normal situation. And I actually recently published a paper at SEPS which explains uh, this, the link between wage gap and, and inflation. So thinking in terms of, get, of stock instead of, of flow, in relation to wages uh, versus inflation. So if you could comment on, on this. Many thanks. Let us collect three or four questions, please. Sure. Ricardo Reese from the LSE, and this is a question to Aviv. Um, you focused almost entirely on cost of living measures of inflation, what you call true inflation, which are, of course, dominated by changes in relative prices, and thus the substitution response of consumers to those as well as the relative price difference between input prices and output prices, i.e. pass-through. A very important concern of central banking or of macro more generally is not with the relative price part, but with the pure inflation part that is the homogeneous of degree one side of prices, that is to what extent when the unit of account changes, all the prices move together or not. And that's really central to what anchoring of inflation is or not. With regard to that, I would call it equally true inflation, but that part of the inflation process, to what extent do you think that these uh, patterns you've identified bring us new insights? That is, to what extent when all prices go up, or even relatedly when monetary policy changes in that sense, the unit of and the anchor and unit of account change, do we observe that because of more information in online prices, we'd observe a much faster pass-through? If you want the nominal part, pass-through should be one, unambiguously, no matter what your theory of demand is, insofar as the unit of account um, has changed in demand, all demand and profit functions are homogeneous to degree one. Do we think that with the more information of online, we see that nominal pass-through of one to everything, or actually less because the confusion between nominal and real becomes more severe in this new world or not? In the same row, just moving three, yeah? Yeah, Nick, at the University College London. Uh, just to uh, follow up on Aviv's uh, point about the relationship or the, the puzzle between the rising prices because of uh, market power and the uh, low inflation. Uh, do you have an idea of what the role of technology could be? Because if, you know, if the only thing we consume is uh, microchips for uh, computers, we would see decreasing prices, okay? So there would be negative inflation. Now, the world is much more complex and we consume many other things, but one of the things we see is that there's a big change in the distribution of markups, not just the average, okay? Why we see the increase in markups is because really the top 90th percentile is going up. And that seems to suggest that there's something underlying the distribution of TFP, productivity of firms, that's changing. And I wanted to know if you have any idea of how that might be explaining the relationship between this low inflation and at the same time rising prices uh, at the firm level. The, what, the last thing we, s we see that uh, uh, the, the GDP deflator and CPI are not moving jointly. So the GDP deflator is about 20 points lower over uh, the last uh, four decades. Many thanks. And then Yanis, and then we'll make a stop otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're going to have to start again. because Exactly. And Yanis, sh short, please. Short yes, question. very short. Thank you. Uh, Yanis Lunaras from the Bank of Greece. Um, those of us uh, who have uh, um, grown up uh, loving the micro foundations of macroeconomics, I would like uh, to use your, your two papers uh, to explain why the Phillips curve um, has become flatter. So can we say from your pricing equation 
that uh, we are in an era now that marginal costs are fixed and constant. And uh, the production structure is, that, uh, is such that, uh, from your, your paper, Michael, uh, the concentration in retail has fallen a lot. So it approximates perfect competition. So the combination of very low concentration in, uh, in retail and um, constant marginal cost produce a flat Phillips curve. Okay, so Aviv, I think you should start. Okay, so let me start. Actually, let me start with the last one, which um, the truth is I have no idea. Um, I mean, I think that's the kind of uh, discussions that we should have, uh, folks that are used to working with them, um, um, with um, uh, Phillips curves and the implications of it. Um, and, you know, because for me, I'd have to go back to my, you know, days in graduate school to, um, uh, to think about, and then try to couple them with realistic assumptions. So for example, uh, you did make an assumption in there, and you know, maybe competition in retailing is increasing. That could be one sector, but maybe things are changing, although I say maybe, that's the key. Um, I think what we want is to really start with good macroeconomics, folks who really understand the macro implications, but making sure that we have good foundations in terms of the assumptions that go in. So let me give you an example, actually, something that uh, uh, Michael was talking about when he was talking about the difference between men and women before you even gave the answer. I mean, I wish you would have actually stopped and turned to me because I would have told you women are the main shoppers, okay? I mean, that's a fact that those of us that have been working with the Nielsen, by the way, it's not AC Nielsen, it's Nielsen. They've changed the names about 10 years ago. Um, that have worked with that know that. So I think that's a fact that I had no idea that's relevant to anything that macroeconomists talk about. But had you kind of asked me the question, I would have told you right away, that's where to look. Now, you found it on your own, which is great, but I think that's the type of interactions that we can have. So that's pretty much all that I, I have to say. Uh, working back, let me now kind of go to the... No, no, let, let us perhaps finish first the last question because Michael was asked too, and then we go back okay. to the other three, if you don't mind. Michael, anything no. to comment on Janis? Yeah, no, Janis, I, I, I totally agree with you that I think we, we have to understand, so because in the, it's definitely the case that retail, from, as I also argue in terms of inflation expectations, it's crucial for the behavior of individuals in terms of the expectations, how they actually uh, behave. And so ultimately, I definitely think, given that it's a substantial fraction of the consumption expenditure, that it c might help explain some of the patterns we actually see in terms of movements of, of the Phillips curve, or flattening of the Phillips curve in the, in the last decade. But to the extent that it's the Nielsen data only, um, and Nielsen, not AC Nielsen, <laughs> only makes roughly 10, 15% of the overall uh, expenditure of individuals, it might be a part, but I, I don't think it can actually uh, fully explain all of the flattening we have, we have observed. Okay, so let me take uh, in turn. First, uh, the question about the, um, you know, I call the wage dynamics. So I think you bring up an excellent point. Actually, we are talking over it um, uh, at dinner uh, last night. Um, I do think there's a very interesting question in dynamics, almost if you think of kind of through a search, a wage search um, uh, model and just the interaction, if you want, you know, search slash bargaining between uh, firms and workers um, as to whether what could happen in a recession as firms use that as an opportunity to cut costs, costs that they maybe should have cut even before the recession, but in something that gives them an excuse in that bargaining for whatever way. I mean, you can model it in a bunch of different ways. Cut the cost, and then it really changes dynamic post, um, post recession. Right, so there's kind of a, the whole question of now when you're bargaining about the, um, the wages, you kind of set in some sense of different expectations because you really lower the level. And I, that's kind of maybe I'm misinterpreting your question, but that's one way to, to look at things. And I agree with you. There's a lot to look there and look at the relationship. And I, I touched just briefly on that one point about the increased monopsony power. But you could imagine that we want to really look seriously at the wage setting behavior where it's really kind of a bargaining process with maybe changing bargaining weights before and after the recession. I mean, that's at least the way that I would interpret your question. So I'm not sure I answered it, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting point to look at. Uh, Ricardo, um, to your point, I mean, I agree that, you know, when we measure inflation, there's different things, right? From a micro point of view, we're always trying to kind of look at more as a cost of living um, uh, type of measure, and then we really care about the welfare implications, and we care about the um, you know, is this a welfare measure, is it not? And maybe that's not what's really kind of been interested in looking at. 
Uh, maybe, maybe not. I mean, you'd have to, uh, to tell me. Um, but I think some of that same dynamics, I mean, there was something that you said in the middle that I didn't quite understand. You said that I think kind of your working assumption that at some level the pass really is one. I mean, I didn't quite understand what... Okay. So that was the distinction of relative relative prices. And on that, it's equally important, not more or less than the relative prices. Okay. Um, so since the dollars, nothing changes in Amazon's actions. It's such yeah. a rational behavior. Right? Yeah. So I agree with you. That takes away that first part of the talk, and we're talking about substitution bias and, uh, and changes. And maybe you say, well, maybe we don't want to sort of see, you want to hold a fixed basket. I, I agree with you uh, completely on that. Uh, but some of the other issues in terms of the secular trends and the pass route, the actual raw prices of the individual commodities, um, I think, are still in play, right? So, I mean, it could be that, you know, forget, you know, the basket. We just literally had a single commodity that we were following. That was what we were targeting. Uh, you could imagine that at that point, there's going to be just less of pass-through from underlying costs, either because of the longer supply chain, either because of a change um, uh, in competition, maybe other things as well uh, that would impact it as well. So I agree with you. And, uh, and to the extent that they, you know, that's why I said I don't actually have an answer of this is what's causing the low inflation. Okay, I think I was trying to be very clear about that. There is no, at least no bottom line that I'm willing to stand behind. Just here's a bunch of things to think about. And then finally, uh, should yeah. I yeah. Mm -hmm. Jan's, um, Jan's point, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, there was actually a bullet point I didn't get to at the end of the bottom of the slides. I think there's some really interesting things that we need to kind of put together in terms of, so just at a very sort of basic level, uh, this goes back to actually when Philip contacted me to, to give this talk. Um, I thought that what he was going to ask me is, why are prices so high? Not what inflation is so low, because that's a discussion that, you know, we're having in I.O. circles, that markups are high, right? And markups high don't necessarily translate to high prices, because you could say, well, maybe it's about pushing the cost down, again, going back to the bargaining models and, um, and driving that down. But then he kind of pointed, you know, we at the central banker level worry about low inflation. Said, yeah, I guess I've been hearing that in the news, but somehow it was a different part of my brain. I never put it together with the, you know, the research part. Um, and I think we need to. We need to kind of start thinking of why is it that on one hand, IO economists are talking about, I'm going to bunch you with us, IO economists. IO economists are talking about higher markups, which would lead, you know, think naturally to higher prices, but there's also low inflation. Now, you can reconcile, say, one is a long-term trend, the other is a shorter term trend, I mean, the last few years, you know, you can still reconcile that. But you want to start thinking about these together, together with productivity uh, and together with welfare, right? I mean, at the end of sort of saying maybe higher markups are not that bad because it's really about reducing costs and increasing efficiency. And yes, Amazon and other firms are getting some of those returns because they're becoming more efficient, but it actually might be good, uh, might be welfare enhancing overall. So I think those are exactly the kind of discussions that we should be having. Okay, well, please. Two, three short questions, and then we have to stop going to the second part. Yeah. Okay, so um, uh, I'm Erica Groshen with Cornell, and most recently commissioner of the BLS. So I want to reassure everybody here that BLS knows that there is online shopping. When I <laughs> in 2016, more than 8% of prices were collected from online retailers, and by 2018, 18, I'm sure that percentage is even higher. So everybody here can rest assured that that's good. Um, uh, but uh, then the other comment is just to add to the list of uh, quite fruitful collaborations would be researchers and central bankers with national statisticians. Because there, I think there are huge gains to be made. So I would just push that too. OK. I think Christine was already asking. So a quick question for Aviv. You talked about how the pass-through from cost shocks largely due to wages is less than one, which we well know. Have you looked at, are there differences from the pass-through if the cost shock comes from commodity prices or oil prices versus wages? Because you could see there is a trend over the last decade. More of the cost shocks have come through very volatile oil, oil prices, commodity prices, largely linked to emerging markets. If the pass-through is different, that might have affected inflation dynamics. 
And I could just quickly think of arguments how it could go both ways. On one hand, you might have firms pass through less of a cost shock due to oil prices or commodities because you think it's temporary. So don't adjust prices if you have a sort of sticky price model. But on the other hand, the supply chain argument could work the other way. Because if you get a cost shock that's oil prices or commodity prices, it affects every stage of the supply chain. So then you might get more pass through from that type of cost shock. So I was wondering if you'd looked at that or had any, any evidence. Okay, thanks, Christy. Benoit? I, I wanted to come back to Ricardo's question because I agree it's, uh, it's very important for us central bankers. And I would like to try it in a different way, uh, which is uh, to relate it to, uh, to Lucas 72 somehow. That is, we know that information asymmetry is, a, is, a, is an explanation of why prices are sticky. So the question is, uh, in what you see in market structures and in the evolution of market structures, uh, do you see more, it, does it make it more or less easy for consumers to extract information on the general level of prices, which was Ricardo's question, which then would imply that uh, uh, you, we would see more or less nominal rigidities? Okay. I have to st I'm very sorry. I have to stop here. We will have a second chance for questions later on. Okay. So I'll make my answers very, um, uh, sure. very brief. Yeah. Yes, I agree. <laughs> no, I don't know the answers to commodities. Um, I don't know, I think is the <laughs> short answer. Uh, I, I have a hunch that it's actually getting a little bit harder, again, because prices are individualized and more complex, but it's just a gut feeling. I can't actually point to any specific research. That is very honest, and I know that in the second row there is a gentleman um, who wanted to ask a question for quite a while. <laughs> I, I just, uh, um, I'm Steve Cicchetti from the Brandeis International Business School. Um, the, um, your focus is, seems to me to be primarily on goods prices, and I'm wondering whether, which, which account for about 25% roughly of consumption, and, and so I'm wondering whether or not you have anything to say about the parts of uh, service prices, especially if I look at, if I link this back to Jim Stock's paper, the, the primary uh, items that we are bad at measuring are actually not goods prices, uh, but they're service prices. So can you use any of what you're doing to help us with service price measurement? Thank you. Many things. Theoretically, yes, until we get the data, until we get that haystack, or all, you know, we're all drunks looking under the lamppost. Okay, so let us, um, we will have a second chance, yeah? Um, so let us move to the second part about wage setting. Um, Uta, your turn. Okay, we were too quick, see? <laughs> So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present my work here on productivity growth, wage growth and unions. This is joint work with my colleagues Alice Kügler and Ragnil Schreiner at University College London and CREAM. So in the first part of my presentation, I will provide you with an overview about what actually happened to labor productivity, about wage growth about unemployment and wage inequality in a number of advanced countries over the past two decades, more precisely between 1995 and 2016. My focus will be on uh, Germany and France, the two largest economies um, of the Eurozone. And the data here come from the OECD economic indicators. So let me begin with Germany. So this black line here plots labor productivity measured as GDP at fixed prices divided by the number of hours worked. So as you can see, Germany experienced over this time period relatively robust productivity growth, averaging 1.5% per year. So now what happened to wages? So this red line shows Hourly wages, more precisely, total labor compensation divided by the number of hours worked, deflated by the consumer price index. So as you can see, CPI deflated wages in Germany barely increased between 1995 and about 2007. But more recently, wage growth has actually picked up in Germany. So this blue line here shows wage growth but now deflated using the GDP price index. And in Germany, this actually matters. 
So GDP deflated wages increased more in Germany than CPI deflated wages, but even GDP deflated wages did not increase as much as labor productivity. So this implies that in Germany over this time period, the labor share declined. So what happened to unemployment and employment in Germany? Germany actually had quite high unemployment rates up until 2005, 11% in 2005. But since then, unemployment has steadily gone down and employment rates have gone up. In 2016, um, unemployment rate was 4%. That is a near record low, a level not seen since the, late, the early 1980s. So what about France? France experienced a similar growth in labor productivity to Germany, but in stark contrast to Germany, wages increased in France in line with labor productivity, regardless of whether we deflate wages using the consumer price index or the GDP price index. What about unemployment and employment rates in France? Unemployment has been persistently high in France, over these two decades, it varied between, let's say, 8% and 11%. Here's the picture for Italy and Spain. So neither Italy nor Spain experienced much of a growth in labor productivity over two decades. And wages, regardless of whether we deflate them using the consumer price index or the GDP price index, did not increase much in either Spain or Italy. And although unemployment has come down in these countries recently, it continues to be high and it's above the pre-recession years. Here's the picture for the United States, which in fact looks very similar to Germany. So in the United States, labor productivity has increased more than wages, in particular if wages are deflated by the consumer price index rather than the GDP price index. So, as in Germany, the labor share has declined in the United States. The same is not observed in the United Kingdom. So, the United Kingdom is generally considered uh, also a labor market but that is very flexible, just like the United States. But in the United Kingdom, over this 20-year period, wages have actually increased more than labor productivity. But let me come back to France and Germany the focus of this presentation. So as I've already mentioned, labor productivity increased in the two countries at very similar rates. Wages, on the other hand, well, there, there is the big difference. They increased in line with productivity in France, but did increase much less in Germany than in France. So this means that over this time period, Unit labor costs have actually declined in Germany relative to France. Uh, and competitiveness has improved in Germany relative to France according to this uh, measure here. Uh, just briefly coming back to unemployment, as of 2016, unemployment, the unemployment rate was si is six percentage points higher in France than in Germany. So that is a very large difference. So now what about wage inequality? And here the differences between Germany and France are frankly really striking. So this orange line here shows the evolution of daily wages for full-time workers <coughs> deflated using the consumer price index at the median in Germany. Okay, so uh, in line with what you've seen, based on a different data source, median wages have not increased between 1995 and 2007, 2008, but more recently there has been an increase. Now what happened at the top of the wage distribution, at the 90th percentile? Well, in Germany, wages at the 90th percentile have increased considerably more than wages at the median. So wage inequality at the top of the wage distribution has increased in Germany over this um, time period. Now what about wages at the bottom of the wage distribution, at the 10th percentile? Up until, uh, well, 
just before the recession, wages at the 10th percentile declined in Germany, both in absolute terms and relative to the median. But importantly, since 2010, wages at the bottom of the wage distribution have picked up again. And it seems that they, uh, wages at the bottom of the uh, distribution increased more than median wages. So let's compare that to France. So this uh, uh, orange line shows the evolution of hourly median wages, uh, again for full-time workers um, in France, in line with what we've seen um, before. Median wages increased uh, more in France than in Germany. But what about wages at the top of the wage distribution, at the 90th percentile? Now, in stark contrast to Germany, wages at the top of the wage distribution in France have actually decreased relative to the median. And although wage growth on average has been a lot higher in France than in Germany, it looks like that wages at the top of the distribution have increased more in Germany than in France. What about wages at the bottom of the wage distribution, the 10th percentile? Well, once again, in stark contrast to Germany, wages at the bottom of the wage distribution have increased more in France than in Germany. <laughs> okay, so wage growth in France was higher than in Germany, particularly at the bottom of the wage distribution. Wage inequality has increased in Germany, but not in France. Now, what can possibly account for these divergent experiences between France and Germany? So I will focus here on one specific factor, the role of trade unions. And many arguments I will bring forward here are based on the joint work I've done with Christian Dustmann, Bernd Fitzenberger and Alexandra spitz published in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. Um, while I believe this is a very important factor, of course, there are many other factors uh, at play. Uh, many of them have been have discussed here, such as changes in, the composi in, in competition, the rise of superstar firms, technological change, etc. But let me move on to trade unions. So trade unions have historically played and continue to play an important role in the wage setting process in both France and in Germany, and in fact in the Eurozone more generally. So if we want to understand wage setting in the Eurozone, we need to take trade unions seriously. In both France and Germany, wage negotiations predominantly take place at the industry level, where then uh, the trade unions and the employer federations bargain over pay, but also about working conditions more generally, in particular working hours. In both countries, union wages are typically differentiated by skill, and they act as wage flaws. So firms can pay higher wages, but not lower wages. So despite these similarities, there are also some very important differences in the systems of industrial relations between Germany and France. So most importantly, in Germany, only those firms that belong to an employer federation are bound by union agreements. And whether a firm is a member of the employer federation, well, that's voluntary. It's up to the choice of the firm. So this actually means a firm that is currently a member of the employer federation and uh, has recognized union agreements in the past can actually opt out of these union agreements. And in that case, it would then uh, either negotiate wages with the work council, so um, the representative body of the workers at the firm level, or after an, uh, a transition period, it could set wages individually with its workers. At the same time, firms that enter the labor market, they may not join the employer federation to begin with, and hence not recognize the unions. Okay? That's not so in France. In France, the state steps in 
and declares the union agreements to be binding to virtually all firms in the industry. A second important difference is, in Germany, more and more often, union agreements include so-called opening clauses. So opening clauses allow firms that are members of the, of the employer federation and hence in principle bound by these union agreements to nevertheless deviate downwards from the union agreements if the firm uh, is not doing well. So up until very recently, this was not possible in France. And finally, up until very recently, there was no national minimum wage in Germany. There is, however, a national minimum wage in France that, by international comparison, is set at a high level. By the way, the minimum wage in France is directly indexed to inflation. So here we have a direct link, actually, from inflation to wage increases. Um, so this means that uh, the government, the state, plays an active role in the wage setting process in France, but actually not in Germany. And because firms in Germany can say, I'm out, negotiations between trade unions and employer federations tend to be more consensus-based and less confrontational in Germany than in France. So let me tell you what actually happened in Germany over the past two decades. So after the fall of the Iron Curtain, Germany was burdened with the, the cost of reunification. But at the same time, moving production abroad to the former communist countries in Central and Eastern Europe became a credible threat. And in fact, uh, should you get hold of newspapers at that time, you will realize that this was extensively discussed um, in the newspapers. So paying these high union wages became increasingly costly for firms. And indeed, firms started to opt out of the union agreements. And this is illustrated uh, in the figure here, uh, which shows the share of workers who are covered either by an industry-wide agreement or by a firm-level agreement, which do not matter too much. Um, over time, separately in West Germany, the blue line, and East Germany, the red line. So in 1995, about 82% of workers in Germany were covered by these union agreements. By 2016, this had declined to about 60%. In 2016, in East Germany, about half of the workers were covered by union agreements. So this deunionization led to a decentralization of the wage setting process away from the industry level, down to the firm level, or even individual level. And it has helped to make wages, in particular at the bottom of the wage distribution, to be more downward flexible. It also contributed to uh, the low wage growth we've seen in Germany over that time period, in particular at the bottom of the wage distribution. This is illustrated in this figure here. The black line shows the actual wage growth that actually happened in Germany between 1996 and 2000, uh, 2012, deflated using the consumer price index along the distribution of wages. So at the bottom of the wage distribution, the 10th percentile, wages declined by about 6%, whereas at the, bottom, uh, at the top of the wage distribution, the 90th percentile, they increased by about uh, 11 or 12%, illustrating once more the rise in wage inequality that happened in Germany over this time period. Now, the red line shows the counterfactual wage growth that would have occurred if deunionization had not happened. And we computed this using the decomposition methods proposed by Dinardo, Forte, and Lemieux. So this is probably best seen as an accounting exercise, but nevertheless, this suggests that wage growth indeed would have been higher if deunionization had not happened by about 
4% at the median, 2% at the top, and 6% at the bottom. But this is actually not all that happened, because trade unions in Germany adapted, and they were willing to make concessions that also had a profound impact on wage setting within the unionized sector. So first, um, trade unions more and more often agreed to these opening clauses that I've uh, already talked about, that allow firms to pay, um, that, that are members of the uh, Employer Federation and in principle bound by union agreements to nevertheless pay wages below the union wage. So these opening clauses have led to a further decentralization of the wage setting process, now within the formal unionized sector. And they have made wages more downward flexible even within, within the unionized sector. And at the same time, trade unions in Germany simply showed extraordinary wage restraint. So already in 1995, Klaus Zwickel, then the leader of one of the largest trade unions in Germany, said that his union is willing to accept wage increases based on inflation and the cost of living rather than productivity increases in exchange for more jobs. So here, by the way, we have another direct link from inflation to wage increases. Um, but let's take a look what type of wage increases trade unions and employer federations actually agreed upon over this time period. So this blue line shows the increase in labor productivity. Um, that's what we've seen in earlier figures. This red line here shows the cumulative wage increases deflated by the consumer price index that trade unions and employer federations agreed upon. So as you can see, that these wage increases are, um, are uh, smaller than the, the increases in labor productivity over this time period. And moreover, you can see, uh, what you can see is that this red line is flat over a number of years. So the time period from about 2003 to 2008 is particularly striking here, because here, year after year, over a five-year period, trade unions accepted a nominal wage increase just equal to the consumer price index, the, the inflation according to the consumer price index, even though over this time period labor productivity had increased and even though over this time period, unemployment had started to come down. The green line shows the wage growth that was actually realized in Germany. As you can see, this was less than the wage increases agreed upon by the trade unions and the employer federations. And that's um, first because not all firms are bound by these union agreements, and second because of the opening clauses. So to recap, in Germany over the past two decades, we saw a remarkable decentralization of the wage setting process away from the industry level to the firm level or the, indiv and the individual level. And this has helped to make wages at the bottom of the wage distribution more flexible. And importantly, this process occurred without the intervention of the German government. Rather, the, system, the Germany's system of industrial relations proved to be flexible enough to allow for this change. At the same time, um, the differences in the system of industrial relations in France, most importantly the automatic extension mechanisms, as well as the high minimum wage, have prevented France from responding in a similar way. And these differences in industrial relations, well, help us to understand why wage growth was higher in France than in Germany, in particular at the bottom of the wage distribution, but also why measured in terms of uh, the decline in unit labor costs, Germany has become more competitiveness, uh, competitive and quite possibly also why unemployment is now lower in Germany than in France. 
That is the increased downward flexibility of wages in combination with the wage restraint that unions have shown over this period have helped to bring down unemployment in Germany. So let me conclude with some more recent experiences. So I want to emphasize here that wage growth in Germany has picked up since the Great Recession, since 2010. Wage growth has in particular picked up at the bottom of the wage distribution. And since 2010, wage inequality has not increased anymore in Germany. So if I had compared Germany and France in terms of wage growth and wage inequality from 2010 onwards, they actually would have looked fairly, fairly similar. Of course, they are very different in terms of unemployment. At the same time, it's interesting to note that the French and the German system of industrial relations seem to become a bit more similar. So on the one hand, Germany introduced a national minimum wage in 2015 for the first time in its history, um, albeit not quite at the high level seen in France. At the same time, both President Hollande and Macron have recently introduced some labor market reforms in France aimed to bring down unemployment in France um, that have moved the French system of industrial relations a step closer to the German model. So one important component of these labor market reforms essentially was a shift of wage negotiations from the industry level to the firm level. Similar to the decentralization of the wage setting process that happened in Germany over the past two decades. But here it's again important to, to emphasize an important difference between Germany and France. Because in Germany, this decentralization of the wage setting process was not triggered by labor market reform. Right? It happened completely outside the political process and gradually occurred over time. And for that reason, it may actually have been less salient for the German worker than the labor market reforms are for the French worker. So, moreover, it's important to keep in mind that the decentralization of the wage setting process in Germany, well, that was achieved in a rather consensus-based way because the trade unions were actually on board. It was in part supported by trade unions. The labor market reforms in France, on the other hand, have been very controversial, have been met with a lot of resistance, and trade unions are not on board at all. In fact, trade unions have been actively involved in organizing demonstrations against these labor market reforms. And, uh, well, let me end my presentation uh, with a statement by Romain Altman, um, uh, the head of one trade union in, in France. There will be no grace period, no truce. Now, that is a very different rhetoric from that of Klaus Zwickel, the former German trade union leader, wage restraint in exchange for more jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Uta. Please, Michael. So thanks for inviting me to, to discuss this very interesting, excellent paper. I think it's, it's fitting that France and Germany came together yesterday and made some very important uh, um, agreements that we're still learning about. And part of this process of understanding how France and Germany can get along for the next 100 years is about understanding how there's a convergence of institutions and how there are also differences in institutions across across these two interesting countries. And they're also very important, not to exclude any other European country, but I think if the, if the Franco-German motor works, then everything else is, is gonna run better. So I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm on board with most of, of this paper. It's an excellent paper based on very careful analysis of micro data, coupled with some macro data from the OECD. It's relevant because understanding how Germany accomplished a, an internal uh, devaluation without an exchange rate is pr probably very important for understanding how Portugal and Ireland have accomplished their adjustments and perhaps how Italy and Greece um, are 
still need to do some adjustment, possibly more in the direction of Italy than, than in the direction of Greece. Uh, my comments will be a kind of a nuanced uh, view of what's going on in this paper. So let me just discuss, re review what it does. It's looking at divergent pay trends in Germany and France in particular, but also in, a, in nine other countries, in nine countries in, in total, and it looks at both functional, you know, capital versus labor, uh, the distribution of, of income in that respect, which I think is very important, looking at the labor share as part of understanding the story, and individual wage inequality within uh, the group of workers that are earning pay. It looks at a great decoupling of wages and productivity that you can see in Germany quite clearly in the data. This is especially true if you look at the CPI rather than the GDP deflator. I think the GDP deflator is the right way to look at this if you want to look at competitiveness. But if you want to understand why workers are dissatisfied, you do want to look at the real wage in consumer, um, in consumer goods and deflate by the, the CPI or some consumption deflator. Um, Dugan, Uta and her colleagues attribute the recovery of Germany's competitiveness as a result of givebacks, what Americans call givebacks or, you know, unions making big concessions, which we saw in the United States in the 1980s. Uh, so the United States is always like 10 years ahead, maybe 15 years ahead. We, we're very proud of being ahead of the Europeans. Uh, the Germans just tend to do it right. The Americans do it in a chaotic way. And the Germans have a controlled, it's a controlled uh, increase in inequality. But I'm going to actually <laughs> make a, a couple of interesting comments. I think, you know, um, Uda's, I think, completely on target in her work with Christian that the, the unions have, have been part of this formula, but it's not the only part. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a nuanced view on this by saying that I think the German labor market reforms of the, of the 2000s, between 2003 and 2005, were absolutely essential as a, as a collateral uh, condition, as a, as, a, as a necessary condition for this to work, and it's based on simple economics. Okay, so we'll get to that in a second. So again, overall, I'm very happy with this paper, and I think it goes back to some older uh, literature that we know on, on the difference of, of, of wage-setting institutions across countries and how important this is in understanding. So this is a, a review of what's happened over the past uh, 40 years, 45 years. One of the most important things I got out of this was looking at the period uh, up until unification, how similar Germany and France are and how important it is for Germany and France to get their act together in the European Union and the monetary union, because if, the, if this axis works, then the monetary union will also work. German unification was a big disturbance, as you can see, a big increase in the employment ratio, because a lot of East Germans were working at the beginning and subsequently lost their jobs. Uh, labor force participation jumped for the same reason, uh, because East Germany had a higher labor force participation. And the last panel shows that GDP uh, and this is, this is GDP normalized on 100 uh, in, in 2010, hasn't really behaved differently. So you really can't say it's because Germany had a great export run, um, or had some other reasons for being so successful. It's really something is going on within the economy, uh, within relative prices. And this is the interesting, you know, the interesting period is that Germany turned the corner uh, around 2005 and, and France uh, didn't. Cyclically, they're very similar. Uh, you can, you know, one of the most interesting points of the, of the paper is that, that hourly productivity has grown in an almost tandem way since uh, for those who are working. And this, is known, this has been known by, for a long time, uh, Solo and Blanchard had a nice McKinsey paper a long time ago where they documented this at the, at the, at the, industrial, at the industry level. So my comments are basically twofold. I'm going to look at, I'm going to look at both uh, the macro side and the micro side. I'm going to have a bunch of comments on the macro side. But most of my comments are on the micro side, and I'm going to get back to this point that institutions, um, the reform of the labor market uh, constitution, if you like, the, the, the treatment of unemployed people and the, uh, the duration of unemployment benefits are essential to understand why the German uh, labor market adjusted the way it did. Having the right union attitude is also important. They're both necessary conditions for this to work. Okay? So there's been a, a well-known, uh, well-documented fact that Germany has been able to have a real depreciation vis-a-vis -vis its European trading partners is one of the reasons why Europe has done uh, probably less well, but your, Germany has done better in terms of uh, the past 20 years. Um, the old idea that it's the price, uh, stupid, it's <laughs> whether you look at the consumer price index or the, or the product uh, 
price index or a, a GDP deflator is very, very important. And I actually have a paper with Jeff on this, Jeff Sachs, who's left the field. But back then, we talked a lot about the wage share in Germany going in the opposite direction when the wage share was rising. Uh, uh, with every oil shock, the wage share was going up. Okay, so this is kind of an old thing. So the question is, we want to look at um, competitiveness in terms of the product deflator or the, the, the price of the stuff that the country's selling. And this is an endogenous variable. It also depends on on the uh, on, you know what the what the country is selling and whether it can pass through or not and whether workers uh, if you look at the markup you see this right away this is a countercyclical variable um, the the uh, the wage share rises in recessions the wage share is kind of the inverse of the markup under certain conditions you can think that over the trend this is because of um, maybe increasing competition or increasing monopoly power in product markets which has increased the wedge the workers get less of the pie could be directed technical change. It could also just be foreign competition. So if you write down the, if you decompose the, the wage share, which is an important variable to look at, uh, you see that it's got this wedge term, uh, which I, I just call the terms of trade for lack of a better uh, word. You could think of holding wages constant. You could have a change in the terms of trade that could make a difference, or you could have changing productivity. And as Uta points out, it's really not um, productivity. Um, and it's, if you look at the wage share, it's, they're both kind of declining since the 1990s. So it's very slight. This is from the, from the European um, Union database. And I also find that the Germans lost a little bit on the terms of trade since uh, unification. So it really must be that Germans made wage concessions. So this is just confirming what she said. Wage concessions across the board, not just at the median, but we'll see later. Um, if you compare what happened in the US, Completely different story. Big, huge loss of terms of trade. This is mostly China, probably, but as well as other things. And you see that Norway, which also figures in her paper, actually goes in the opposite direction. I think that has something to do with oil prices. Um, so on the micro side, this is where I differ a little bit. I think a nuanced view would actually look at labor market institutions more generally, not just at unionization or deunionization. Nominal wages are flexible in Germany for many reasons. Um, I think the fallback position in wage determination is just as important as the willingness of unions to make wage concessions. They're actually simultaneously determined. So the, I'm going to ask the question, the market clearing wage is really the question. Um, is that driving union concessions? And what is that market clearing wage? That's going to have to do with basically what unions have to face when their members become unemployed. Okay, so the level of unemployment insurance is essential to understanding this. And uh, in Germany, this was adjusted in 2003 to 2005. T 2005 was the fourth Hartz law, and other things happened. So this has got to be part of the formula. And you know, I'm going to uh, some of my other work with a with a PhD uh, student has actually confirmed this. That if you look at the the distribution of work in Germany, um, the total number of hours worked since the 1990s hasn't changed at all. It's been pretty much constant. The Germans have managed to do a work-sharing uh, program through the private sector. Okay? And it basically, uh, the way they've done this is through part-time work. So the adjustment on quantities is going to be, as I argue, just as important as the adjustment on wages. And if you look at the, the difference in uh, growth rates in part-time work, to get that huge increase in part-time work, it basically occurred during the 2000 decade, between 2005 and 2010. So this growth is kind of what's interesting. This is taken from her work with Christian, which is an excellent paper. Uh, they look at the same data in this paper, again, with a different, slightly different imputation for the wages. You see that two things are happening. In the 1990s, wage distribution starts to open up from above uh, at the highest level. And I think she's absolutely right that this is all about unions making concession bargaining and allowing the, the companies in trouble to push down wages for their workers. So you have an increase in dispersion at the upper end. But look at the lower end. The real drop in wage uh, at the lowest, at the lowest, this is cumulative wage growth, by the way, to make sure you understand. This is cumulated from the year by year from, the, from, from 1990 equals 100. Uh, the big opening of wage dispersion comes in, in 2003. And that's basically a year after the part-time law was passed and in anticipation of cuts in unemployment benefits, which were implemented in 2005. Okay, so you really have two different developments going on, and that's part of, that's part of the story, and I think they could stress that a little bit more. 
my co-author, um, doctoral student Stephanie Sale and I have actually re replicated their results. Um, we've also looked at part-time workers by making an imputation for part-time workers because they look at full-time workers. And you see that it's even more extreme in Germany in part-time. So understanding this increase in labor supply in the part-time, um, and this is just West Germany, East Germany looks similarly bad, uh, an increase in low pay dispersion after 2003 is kind of the part of the formula. So if you look at the slides, you can see that it's actually true for East and West, albeit a little bit different. Uh, East Germany has a different trend to catch up to. They're still catching up to the West. And uh, part-time, you can see, is much more extreme. The, wage, the hourly wage, imputed drop for, for hourly wage is this larger. Now, this is amazing. This also con con constant with her, but there are other remarks. France has actually had wage compression during the same period. So those who had jobs, and that's why this crazy high growth rate for the 10th for the percentile actually exceeding the, the 90th percentile, that's... You know, that's really showing up in the UAC data. This is full-time workers. I just pulled this from the, from the economic uh, outlook. So they're not, they're not exclusive, but they should be sort of contrasted. And I think, you know, the, it's, they're almost, they both have to, to be true to, have, uh, to understand what happened in Germany. And uh, in our paper, we, we take an old paper by uh, Larry Katz and Kevin Murphy. We look at just basically trying to understand where these wage uh, uh, employment correlations come from across cells of the data set, and we, we say, okay, this, this supply side is, uh, ac is operative in the, in the Hartz reforms. You just see an, an increasing negative correlation of wage growth and employment growth across these cells in that period, which would not be true before and after. And in our work, we basically look at that. So I'm going I'm to kind of zip through this. If you're interested, you can see, um, logically, if the supply curve is moving, you should observe across groups and wage uh, demographics, you should observe a negative correlation of, of wages with uh, employment. On the other hand, you know, obviously this could be true in both, in both hypotheses. If it's about the supply side and Marshall's view of the labor market is right, then you actually see unemployment rates um, falling and participation rates rising instead of falling. Because if you're forcing workers to accept wages they don't want to work for, then you, you'd accept, ex expect wage, labor supply to decline. And again, this is the diagrammatic idea. So the, the schoenberg dusman story would be on the right-hand side if it were just wage rigidity, and if, in fact, you've got a, an increasing uh, pressure on labor supply holding demographics otherwise constant, you'd expect a participation actually to, to rise. Okay, so we look across uh, some cells and we actually get during this period, the comparison 2005 plus minus two years, 2010 plus minus two years is negative. And uh, in the years afterwards, um, it's looking more positive. So if you look at the, if you look at the post, if you look at the pre, the pre-2000, the Hartz reforms, you get no correlation at all. And if you look at more sort of a, sort of a finer grid, um, you still get the same, the same finding. So the, the participation rate is, is negatively correlated with the wage. Uh, across these cells in the post hearts period, okay? So let me just finish by talking about some of the implications for inequality at the personal income level. This is not the same thing as, as wage inequality. I think a lot of people tend to conflate those two concepts. Uh, the German magic has been trying to redistribute income using the social welfare system, topping up low wages. So even if you work for a low wage, even if you work for the minimum wage and if you can't feed your family, you get a top up. It's like the American Earned Income Tax Credit Program. This is what has made uh, Germans less dissatisfied and possibly more willing to accept these, these rather uh, tough nominal changes. Okay, so if you, if you compare this with the United States and, and the UK, you, have, you still have an increase in the income genie across, across countries, uh, across uh, periods, excuse me, uh, whereas in uh, in Germany, this has been fairly fairly constant. It's because the heart system, the heart's reforms, also allowed for topping up of people working at low wages. Okay, this is the last slide. I really like this one. This was sent to me by Pierre Cahuc, who showed me that basically the, you know, you <laughs> everyone likes to work for a job that pays well, but it's better to have a job than not to have one. And this is based on survey evidence. Um, you know, sort of successive years, showing that in uh, France things, uh, people could be made possibly a little bit more happy uh, 
with a little bit more inequality as long as uh, people take care of the income redistribution aspects. So I like this paper a lot. I really like this paper. And we've cited it in our own work. I think uh, they show that, that nominal wage adjustment was the way it happened, um, you know, partially by absolute nominal wage adjustments. And this was crucial for understanding what happened in Germany and perhaps understanding why Germany was able to pull off this uh, internal devaluation, which is something that we used to think was impossible. It happens in the United States all the time. So maybe if Europe wants to move in that direction, they better, better get used to it in both ways, which also means that German wages have to start rising a lot uh, to wipe out their uber competitiveness that they have right now. Um, other margins of flexibility were important. So I already mentioned the, the quantity margin, part-time work is extremely important. Um, in the paper, I, my own paper that I cite, we actually tried to do an, an, an attribution, sort of an imputation of wages for these people because the Germans don't actually get part-time uh, hourly wages. And you can see that those adjustments were even larger. Uh, but the incentives to work part-time actually were implemented before the Hartz reforms. That was the part-time law that was passed in 2002, which increased incentive benefits, uh, incentivized uh, working part-time just to keep in the pension system and get credit for the, the uh, time work. The Germans have, still have a fairly defined benefit system, which is, you know, it's like the, the Dutch uh, in many respects. It's kind of it, understanding the German reform, you just need to go back to, to the Netherlands in the 1980s and understand what they did. And I think you can't avoid saying that the Hartz reforms did a lot of stuff but they, most importantly, they reduced the reservation wages and increased labor force participation for people who had been outside the labor force, old people, especially women uh, who had been uh, outside, maybe raising a family and had an education. And I think the correlation of relative wages and employment across the cells that one would like to look at are actually going to support um, a nuanced view of what the Germans did uh, since, since 1990s. So, thanks. Thank you, Michael. Hmm? Okay. Oh, if you wish to, for sure, for sure. Um, I, I, I will give Uta you know, some minutes to reply to Michael, and then we will make um, the, the round of questions. Yes, so thank you, Michael, for the very nice uh, introduction and I, uh, for the very nice discussion. And I actually agree with you, the Hearts Reforms method as well. So to put it simply, the Hartz reforms provided incentives for workers to accept low wage jobs. But now imagine this reform had been implemented in France with the high minimum wage and the automatic extension mechanisms. Hmm. It's very unclear that in France it would have created new jobs, right? Because wage levels are too high. So I think there is an argument to be made here that there is an important interaction between the system of industrial relations and the unemployment benefit system. So uh, if wage flaws are very high, firms have no incentive to create low wage jobs. If unemployment benefits are very high, workers have no incentive to accept low wage jobs. So in that sense, we totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> Many thanks, Uta. I will start with this side, and I know there was one gentleman in the second row who already tried, and the next, then Louis. Then Danny Gross from the Center for European Policy in Brussels. My question was actually related more to the previous session, but I think it fits also in this one. We have discussed a lot the details of uh, price setting and measurement of uh, various aspects of the CPI. And in this last session, more about uh, wages, which then later presumably via markup <coughs> go into the uh, CPI. But if we ask ourselves, why are we interested in inflation and the general price level? Then I think uh, if you go back to what uh, Larry Summer said at the beginning of this conference, we are concerned because we have very high debt levels and therefore we are concerned about debt deflation. Debt has not been able to service the debt. But if you think about it this way, then we are not so much concerned about the CPI, but we are concerned about actually nominal GDP, meaning the nominal the GDP deflator. Because that determines the average revenues, tax revenues governments can get, 
and the revenues firms can obtain to service their own debt. So if we have that perspective, we want to combat deflation because we are fearing debt deflation, then should we be so much concerned about whether the CPI is properly measured with a half a percentage point here and there goes into profits or markups? Because all of this then goes into the GDP deflator and that should be our summary statistics. So two conclusions. One should be actually then look less at the details of the CPI and more at whether the, CP, <coughs> the GDP deflator evolves along the lines that suggest no debt deflation. And secondly, whether central banks perhaps should also change their target. Their target was done, was chosen, looking backwards to periods of very high consumer price inflation and low debts. Today, we have the opposite combination and therefore should we not ask ourselves whether we should switch to a different target. Many thanks. Perhaps Luis? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for these uh, excellent contributions. I will go back to the dynamics of the labor market uh, wages uh, uh, with two remarks. The first one is that uh, unit labor costs, according to your paper, matter. And the relative performance of unit labor costs, especially in a monetary union, matter more because you cannot resort to uh, the depreciation or devaluation of the nominal exchange rate. So uh, uh, I think that at the end of the day in a monetary union, what determines the relative performance of the different economies is the relative performance or evolution of unit labor costs. And this is something that is especially, especially, especially relevant. And I think that all the problems that we had uh, some years ago in the monetary union were caused not uh, as much because of uh, uh, fiscal policies, divergences, but much more because we had uh, different uh, uh, levels of competitiveness, competitiveness among the different countries of the monetary union. And the second remark is that uh, there, is clear, there is a clear trade-off, according to your, to, your, to your papers, to your contributions, between uh, wage equality and uh, employment creation. You have put forward to concrete cases, Germany and France. Germany, uh, you know, with uh, a better performance, relative performance, and outperforming France in terms of unit labor costs, and having a better performance in terms of employment creation. But simultaneously, in the case of France, uh, wage equality is better than in the case of Germany. And I think that there is something that is especially relevant. is the starting position of the different countries. For instance, Spain. Spain implemented in 2013 uh, a labor reform that uh, uh, what uh, finally uh, uh, pursued was the decentralization of the wage bargaining process. With a 25% unemployment rate, as Spain had in 2011, the only possibility that we had was to create jobs. So that the, the initial starting point of the economies is going to be extremely important in terms of uh, uh, the, the labor market reform and the regulation that you want to implement. I don't know whether you can elaborate a little bit more on that. Thank you. Thank you. Krishna Guha, Evercore Partners. Uh, question for Uta. So uh, you described wonderfully the process by which Germany was able to facilitate this internal devaluation. Uh, a lot of the changes you described, of course, would also be associated potentially with a lower natural rate of unemployment. So I wondered if you, do you have any quantitative uh, assessment of the decline in the natural rate associated with these changes in Germany? And even more ambitiously, would you speculate on what kind of impact this could have in France and other countries adopting these reforms now? Perhaps just one back, one row back. <laughs> Thank you very much. I enjoyed very much the presentations. Uh, I just uh, wanted to make a very general question that it even may apply to the previous panel. And is your assessment of how much uh, global trade has affected the uh, wage determination in uh, 
advanced economies and also in emerging market economies. But you know, having China and uh, India uh, be more present in day-to-day -day, uh, economic activity globally might have an effect on, on, on wage setting. Uh, and that might be an explanation also why we, we see so much uh, now quarrel with <laughs> open trade. Thank you. Thanks. And perhaps the gentleman at the back. Charles Weblow's uh, Graduate Institute. Uh, I want to go back to the uh, point that was raised by Mr. De Guindos. I thought the presentation, both actually, were fascinating. Uh, and you hit this apparent trade-off between in, uh, wage inequality and, uh, and unemployment or employment, whichever you want to, to, to set it. Now, my question is, is, in principle, is this a theoretical uh, condition that there is a trade-off, you can increase one and not the other, or improve one and not the other, and uh, how much empirical evidence we have? Are these just two strange cases that you put face to face, or is this a, a general principle that we find in the data? Okay. Well, many thanks. Let us finish with the first round of questions, and um, Uta, perhaps you would like to start. Okay, so the first question was about the CPI index rather than GDP index. So I don't consider this my expertise. As labor economists, we typically focus on the consumer price index simply because that's viewed as a better measure for the cost of living. Uh, so let me come back to uh, the other questions that was raised. Um, so first part of uh, the question over there was, well, what did the internal devaluation that Germany uh, actually achieved hap uh, uh, implied for the other countries, for the other EU countries? And yes, that is an important uh, point. On the other hand, I mean, Germany started with a high unemployment rate and some devaluation was probably necessary to, to, to bring down unemployment. Mm -hmm. There have been a lot of questions about the trade-offs between wage inequality and increase in wage inequality and the level of unemployment. So now, if the unemployment level is high and we want to bring that down, yes, probably there is a price to pay, and that price is increased wage inequality. On the other hand, but it also should be pointed out here that part of the declines uh, in wages at the bottom of the wage distribution seen in Germany is precisely because more workers have entered the labor market, right? So the composition of workers who are actually working has changed, and that in itself might have brought down wages. Uh, another aspect that is really very important here is the dynamic aspect. So it makes a big difference where the workers are stuck at these low wages for year after year over a 10-year period, or whether these low wages are actually stepping stones to better jobs. So I think we do need more research on this dynamic aspect, and that's also what uh, my current research agenda is, is partly about. Um, so the question over there was also about uh, the trade-off between wage inequality and unemployment. So that there are countries uh, which have relatively low unemployment rate and not too much uh, and relatively low wage inequality, like the Scandinavian countries. Germany since 2010 had very low unemployment rates and actually wage inequality declined. So maybe there is not necessarily a trade-off, but if we start at very high unemployment levels and want to bring this down, as I've mentioned before, the price probably is wage inequality at the bottom goes up. Um, yes, so another question was uh, to, to try to quantify how much of the decline in unit labor costs and the increase in, in competition, we, uh, so, so to what extent it brought down the natural unemployment rate. Now, that's a very tough question to answer. And uh, I'm, as a labor economist, trained in program evaluation methods to get causal effects. I cannot answer that question. 
because all we have here is variation over time. So it's close to impossible to, to disentangle. Well, what's the impact of um, the decline in the unit labor, co labor costs? What's the impact of the increase uh, of the labor market reforms from just general time trends that have happened over time? Uh, there also was a question about the impact of global trade on wage setting. Um, so, so research for Germany actually suggests uh, the research that in general has been done in this area was more about what it did to employment levels and less so how it affected wage inequality. So in the US there has been some very influential work that the increased competition with China uh, has uh, reduced, um, um, has, has declined jobs in the manufacturing sector. That did not happen same extent in Germany, simply because Germany has a trade surplus um, overall, um, and uh, even though not exactly with China. Uh, I guess it is interesting to note that wages in China have more recently come up. Uh, the manufacturing sector in China has started to go down, and service sector has, has gone up, as we would expect in a developing country. So maybe this is actually now um, decreasing the wage pressure um, in, in the advanced economies. Michael, you'd like to comment? Yeah, I just had to answer Charles's point. I think it's, uh, it's not a necessary trade-off, but I think some countries, like Uta said, are, are better equipped. If you educate your less skilled workers or have continuing re-education like Denmark or Sweden, uh, I think you have a better chance of picking up the people who lose their jobs at the lower end of the distribution. And I think if, if these people are out of the, the labor force for a long time or out of work, they lose skills and they become even less productive. So the, the wage dispersion is kind of a, the necessary wage dispersion could actually get, could get larger. And um, I wanted to say one more th about, your, about your point about the, the, the Nairu. I, there are some people who have tried to do this with models. And one of the Hearts reform aspects that people don't talk about very much is the Hearts three reform, which increased the efficiency and the efficacy or, or the, of the employment agencies which Germany uh, put on the computer. It's, it's all nationwide. You can find out where there are vacancies everywhere. And there's now this increased pressure on people to take the jobs. Uh, this um, makes a big difference. I think that probably has knocked at least one or two percentage points off the, if you believe in the Nairu or the band, it's gone down. And I think this explains why German wage pressure is still rather, you know, manageable at the, at, the, at the present. Well, many thanks. I um, have a gentleman at the back who already tried first. I'm a, I'm a journalist from Italy, from Corriere della Sera, Federico Fubini. Thank you. It was a fascinating presentation. I wish Italy uh, could have applied some of the same arrangements oh. at firm level. Uh, but I have... Um, uh, one question mark on what is uh, you define as competitiveness or uh, social inclusion in, uh, increasing the employment rate because uh, for instance uh, my question about German competitiveness is uh, to what extent it depends from the arrangements that you have illustrated and how much uh, supply chains with Central uh, and Eastern Europe uh, matter so it would be interesting to separate the two things and how much maybe Germany was better, but I don't think there is a single complex industrial product in Germany that is fully made in Germany. So to what extent the value add that it has been produced uh, somewhere else in the European Union, to what labor costs. So I would, I mean, I, I would, I wish I could see something that makes this difference. and. And the other point, uh, it, it is very interesting what you showed on uh, wage inequality, but how, however, you mentioned it, here we are talking about wage inequality, not inequality per se. And I mean, when you look at OECD data on Gini, uh, Germany is a, a less unequal country than others in the EU in terms of income inequality, but it, it is more unequal in terms of wealth inequality and increasingly so. Um, and if you think about the fact that many companies are family owned and as you showed um, 
the labor share has declined. Probably there is a, a measure of inequality that doesn't show up in your graph because it's wealth inequality of family shareholders. So I was wondering whether you have any comments on that. Well, I, I will move to this part, but ask please for short questions because, you know, we are already a little bit late. Yeah, 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 I know. <laughs> short questions, two yeah. short questions. I'm allowed two, am I? If they're short. Uh, Richard Portis, London Business School. Uh, the first one, among the many striking <coughs> charts uh, you showed Uta, in your presentation, <laughs> one struck me particularly, and that was the participation rate chart. The enormous increase in German uh, labor participation rates. Um, what's the explanation for this? Especially since you know you might say, oh, it's part-time jobs, and maybe that's maybe that's the answer. Uh, but we tend to think of obstacles to female labor participation in Germany. That doesn't seem to have uh, played the kind of role that you might expect. The second question is a bit more directed towards Michael, but not entirely. Um, we talk, and the 90% the of the talk about, you, about competitiveness, um, however uh, interpreted, uh, is about unit labor costs. But isn't that, shouldn't we be thinking more in terms of the real exchange rate? Uh, you come close to it, talking about P over CPI, but shouldn't be, we really be talking about the price of traded relative to non-traded goods? Mm -hmm. That seems to me to be the, the central. And, and if you do look at that, as for example, Sophie Piton uh, has done in her research, um, you find that the story is really quite different. Many thanks. And in the back there, the gentleman. The first, on the, in the second row, you are exactly correct there, yeah? Uh, Guntram Wolf Brügel, um, I have a question um, also on this fascinating paper uh, as regards the role of capital. Um, if capital and labor are complements, which I think most estimates suggest, um, then wage developments and uh, the labor share also depend on, on investments and the capital um, that the economy has. And one of the interesting uh, features of the German economy is that both the public sector as well as the, uh, the private sector have had uh, very, very little um, investment throughout the last 20 years. Uh, the corporate sector has uh, had investment below that of uh, France and Italy for the last 20 years. The public sector as well. Um, the private sector has, the, the corporations have massively deleveraged um, uh, basically starting 2003, 4, um, around that time. So, so I guess my question is, um, what role does this scarcity of capital uh, play in the wage developments um, that you documented? Um, is it a cause or an effect? Thank you. And the last one, the gentleman on the side. Uh, Jonathan Hazel, I'm a PhD student. I was wondering, um, because you have this great German data where you can track individual workers on time, one can potentially disentangle these two sources of wage variation between worker compositional shifts and within worker growth over time. And of course, these are conceptually very different and one could have slow overall wage growth while simultaneously having rapid wage growth within individual workers. And I was wondering if you've, if you've done that and if so, what, what happens and if that changes our results in some way. Thank you. Many thanks. Well, I have to finish. Um, the round of questions because we are late. Not as late as yesterday, Christine, yeah? So, <laughs> please, quick, quick answers. So then let answers. me ask, uh, very quickly, uh, yes, um, it's very important to distinguish between wage inequality, income inequality, and wealth inequality that is often muddled up in the discussion. It depends on the question you're addressing, which is the more relevant one. Uh, there was a question about uh, the striking increase in labor force participation rates in Germany. Um, Michael probably knows more about this than I do. But it was to a large extent because women started to return to the labor market, although they had been out of the labor market for a while. And many returned part-time. And the Hartz reforms probably had something to do with that. So uh, the last question on um, wage, uh, on compositional shifts and wage increases or decreases within individuals. Uh, you are absolutely right, Jonathan. In Germany, we have longitudinal data, 
to exactly analyze this question, and uh, this is what we are working on right now. So I can't give you give you answers, but this very clear, very clearly, very important if we want to understand um, the impacts uh, of the increase in in wage inequality. Um, finally, there was a question about uh, uh, the role of capital in the wage setting process. Let me be honest here, I, I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I can try to pick up on Gutram's question because uh, it's, it's, it's simply an isoquant. Uh, the low wages in Germany have, have, have actually encouraged firms to move away from capital. And I think that's the best way of explaining what's happened. And if you look at the, the level of technology and meatpacking plants in Germany, I've, I've heard a description of this uh, from people who are actually from Belgium and France, they actually complain that German methods are more labor intensive uh, because they're importing workers from Eastern Europe. They're, these are, you know, out insourced workers from Eastern Europe to work in, the, in these meat packing plants, which probably will go out of business now with the minimum wage. So it's, you know, the, thank goodness the, the economics seem to be working. I have one last comment. I really liked the last slide of Uta with this, or, that she showed with the picture of the, the worker burning tires. The French love to burn tires <laughs> and strikes. And this, to me, is, is kind of a pinnacle of the whole discussion. If you want to get convergence between Germany and France or France and Scandinavia, you need to, you need to create trust between works, workers and management. And the Works Council, for all its criticism in the United States, is actually a very effective way of sharing data um, with the workers via management. And it has led to a lot more accommodating outcomes. If, if I think of the French the French have the Conseil d'entreprise, but it's not really effective. Uh, and it, obviously, it's not effective either because you wouldn't have people burning tires. It's a complete waste of time and resources. So, you know, let's try to figure out a way to get collective bargaining on track in France and, and Italy to, to, to get the outcomes that Uda has talked about. Okay. Well, many thanks. I do see that we have still many, many questions. I'm very sorry. Before closing the session, Come, I'd like to come back to Daniel's uh, question on the GDP uh, deflator. I mean, um, uh, the central bank's mandate is all about uh, price stability, so it might make sense yeah, to look on price uh, uh, setting, um, apart from all the questions around the GDP deflator. But this would be perhaps a new session in a new environment uh, next year. Who knows? Yeah, many, many thanks. Uh, many thanks to um, my presenters, to the speakers, and uh, to the lively debate. And now you will have a shorter, a shorter coffee break. Yeah, uh, drink a little bit quicker, talk a little bit faster, and um, you will be called in for Benoit's panel then afterwards. And don't forget to vote for the young economists. <laughs> Oops.